The Mayo Clinic's been engaged in trying to formulate better strategies for evaluating peoples with Barrett's esophagus. And primarily what we've been looking for is a technique to replace or enhance the existing standard, which is using random biopsies throughout an area of the GI tract, which is basically a tube, and you just take biopsies all around the tube to try and figure out whether or not there's any signs that cancer will develop. In the past, this has all been based on these little tiny pieces of tissue that we send to the pathologist who will then examine them under a microscope. Well, there's a number of problems with that. The first is that each little piece of tissue, though it's represented the area it came from, overall is less than 1% of the area of the Barrett's esophagus. So the whole treatment strategy for a patient depends on whether or not we sample the right 1% of tissue. That leads to a lot of problems, and it leads to physicians telling patients, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, and it turns out that, you know, we missed an area that was significant. That, and it's very expensive to do. A lot of patients that don't have anything wrong with them, we biopsy all this tissue anyhow, and we keep watching them because we don't trust the system because we know it has these flaws. There just isn't anything better. So now we've been looking at a way of doing fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is basically a genetic type of analysis. It uses small probes that binds to specific regions of DNA, specific genes, that we can look at what they call gene copy number. Basically, whether or not a gene is there or not, and whether a gene is amplified. In other words, there's multiple copies of it. Now, what we try to do with this test that we thought was a kind of a cool thing to do was to actually do this not based on samples of tissue uh, or biopsies like I just informed you, that's a big problem because if we do it that way, you know, we could miss 99% of the tissue. We're using a technique that's based on cytology, which is we just gather cells from the surface of the Barrett's esophagus and then we can analyze these cells with fluorescent cytohybridization, hybridization and we look for any changes that indicate that there may be cancer occurring. Now this has been done in other areas, for instance the bladder, and it's a well-used test in that system. This, however, has been the first development that it's been used in Barrett's esophagus. Now what Mayo has done in the past is first figure out which probes to use, and we do this using techniques like comparative genomic hybridization, figure out what areas of the genome is unstable in Barrett's esophagus. Then we went on to do a probe selection study where we took a number of probes, 12, and we shrunk the number down to four of the most reliable and predictive probes that we can use to sort out who has high grade dysplasia of cancer versus people without any signs of cancer-like changes. So that worked out pretty well, and we've published that data. Now what the most recent publications are, are very important. One is uh, the one looking at our prospective study using FISH is to determine how it should be applied. And basically, you know, there's a big question. What we're not saying is we don't believe that a gastroenterologist is going to look in the GI tract and say, well, gee, there's, there's nothing there and I'm just going to use fish and that's all I'm going to do. Most likely, he's going to look and he's going to, with his little endoscope, and he's going to say, gee, is there anything wrong? And we're going to say if they see anything wrong, of course, we should do biopsies of that. That's the gold standard. But it's all the other rest of the area that doesn't look abnormal. If that rest of the tissue is sitting there, what we advise you to do is to take some of these cytological scrapings. Now the trouble with the cytology is it's not well worked out how you should collect these cells. So that study was designed to look at different collection devices. We use brushes with a lot of bristles, brushes with not so many bristles, and then we use what's called a net. And the neat thing about the net is it, can, it is much, much bigger than a little tiny brush. A brush that fits through an endoscope is maybe a centimeter in length, half an inch. So you have to brush a lot to cover an area of barrens.
the net is just basically almost like the like uh, looking at a screen on a window. It's a cross-sectional kind of of uh, material that we can open up in the esophagus and it just basically gathers the cells. But it can do it over almost a two to three inch area mm -hmm. rather than the half inch. So it can cover a lot in a hurry and it's a lot easier to use. But we weren't sure which one did the best in finding abnormalities. So in this study we looked at about 180 patients which we randomized to each of these different devices. And we found out, we, we try to simulate how they might be applied in the clinical situation. So we took some of these before we took biopsies and we did some of these after we did biopsies. And we found some very interesting results. We found the brushes, both of them, worked about the same. Didn't matter how many bristles they had, they worked about the same. But they seemed to work a little bit better before you did the biopsies. The net, on the other hand, definitely did better after you did the biopsies. But the net and the brushes turned out to be relatively the same, especially if you looked at them in terms of the brushes being done before biopsies and the net being used afterwards. The net, we think, would probably work the best in the clinical situation. And that would be a whole new change for gastroenterologists because they aren't used to collecting cells that way. In particular, what we could imagine a gastroenterologist doing is doing the endoscopy, finding the abnormal areas, doing a few biopsies, not the many they have to do now, and then just using the net to sample the cells in the rest of the area. We believe that would not only decrease the time and exposure a patient has to an endoscope down the throat, but also lead to a much more comprehensive evaluation. Now the second study, a very important study which we'll be uh, presenting as far, part of a multi-center study with m numerous other institutions, but we are the lead authors on this study, is using these fish probes in a retrospectively identified or historical control group of patients who had Barrett's esophagus without high-grade dysplasia or cancer and then developed these very significant cancer-like lesions, if not cancer itself. So we went back and we looked at these patients and looked at their specimens before they developed the cancer or high-grade dysplasia and saw if we could find these genetic changes identified by FISH to see which one of these would be important in predicting cancer development. And we did this. This was a fairly large study. It was designed to have roughly about 100 patients that progressed or progressors and 200 that did not progress. And we were blinded. In other words, we didn't know whether they were the progressors or non-progressors and we were asked to identify them. And we we're able to find significant benefit to doing FISH in patients that progressed when we found markers that indicated polysomy. Now polysomy is a specific kind of genetic change where we found more than one marker had amplification. In other words, more than one gene copy number increase in more than one gene in that patient. Now the neat thing about fish is even if you find this in one cell, that's significant. Now the test didn't show that the other types of marker combinations such as a loss of a marker or something like that would be significant. However, one thing to keep in mind is that this particular retrospective study could only be done on tissue samples that had been collected way in the past and there was no correlation between where those tissues were taken and where the cancer may have developed later. So there was a little bit of flaw in that and so the studies designed basically to decrease the sensitivity of these markers. We believe that with using the brush and the sampling as we did in the first study I described, we can do this much better. But even in this retrospective study, it was statistically significant. If you found a patient with polysomy, even if they didn't have evidence of 
neoplastic change like high grade dysplasia or cancer before, you could reasonably predict they were going to advance in the future. And that change lasted out as long as four years prior to the development of the high grade dysplasia or cancer. In other words, these markers are pretty good for predicting something's going to happen not only in the near term but even the long term. So that's an important finding. And we think that this helps with the development of fish as a predictor of cancer in Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is a metaplastic condition of the distal or esophagus. It occurs basically where the esophagus and stomach join. Now, it's produced by chronic inflammation produced by reflux or heartburn. Now, 20% of Americans suffer from heartburn. That certainly is not the number that develops Barrett's esophagus. Only a small number of these actually will progress to get Barrett's esophagus. What's interesting and what's a little bit alarming to people is about half the people who develop Barrett's esophagus don't have symptoms of heartburn. They just get the metaplasia. So they have what we might call clinically silent disease. They really don't know they're having it, but they are having it, and they can develop Barrett's. Now, if you look at Barrett's in the overall population, it's probably between 1% to 2% of the general population. Good studies in the United States really haven't been done where they looked at everybody in one population. In Sweden, this has been done as about 1.6%. If you include all of the people with even what we call short segments or small amounts of Barrett's esophagus, that's where the change is confined, really just at the, about the bottom inch or so of the esophagus where it joins the stomach. Now, the only real significance of the Barrett's esophagus is its cancer risk. It's believed that almost all adenocarcinomas of the esophagus develop because of Barrett's esophagus. And adenocarcinomas of the esophagus are the most rapidly increasing incidence of cancers of any cancer in the United States. It actually exceeds even that of melanomas in terms of their increase. Nobody's really quite sure why it's increasing that rapidly, but it is. The other significant factor, unfortunately, about esophageal adenocarcinoma is by the time it's detected, it's almost uniformly fatal, and there isn't good treatment for it if you wait for detection because of symptoms. That's the reason why it's so important for us to develop predictors of development of cancer in Barrett's esophagus. Right now, what we, our hopes for fish is really fairly big as far as Barrett's is concerned. We hope to be able to change the whole way doctors practice. Right now, spend a, instead of tediously taking lots of biopsies that produce discomfort, increased risk to the patient, and doesn't work very well, we hope to replace that by a much more intelligent strategy where we only biopsy these areas that don't look so good and then we can cover the rest of the tissue using this cytology-based technique so that that way we can be comfortable without missing anything, assuring the patients get better care, and decreasing the discomfort and risk to patients. Great. I think we've got what we need.